Grab your Bibles and open, please, to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And as you're turning, I just want to say thanks to Joe and all of our musicians for preparing every week to help us into the presence of the Lord. They, they work really hard, and so I'm really thankful that they allow the Lord to use their gifts in that way. So, Joe and musicians, thank you. You know, when, uh, when we have hot weather like we've had over the last few days, sometimes the authorities will issue what is called a health advisory, meaning that it's just too stinking hot out there, and the best thing to do is just stay inside in the air conditioning. Well, Pastor James, uh, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, writes this letter to believers who are scattered around different parts of the world, and he writes to give them not a health advisory, but a wealth advisory. And so, let me just pick up reading in chapter 5 and verse 1. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvester have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who are not opposing you. Perhaps you followed the tragic story revolving around the multimillionaire Jeffrey Epstein. He is... Uh, was one of the most powerful money managers in the world. He owned uh, mansions all over the world, including what was at the time the largest private residence in Manhattan, which is saying a lot, isn't it? He was personal friends with some of the most famous and wealthy people in the world, including at least two U.S. presidents. Well, all of that began to unravel a few years ago when he was accused of exploiting teenage girls in a massive sex trafficking ring. And he was able to wiggle out of his, his legal problems for a while, but uh, last month he was arrested again under the same charges and put in jail. And so yesterday, a disgraced Jeffrey Epstein, one of the most wealthiest and powerful men in the world committed suicide in his jail cell. When I learned that over the weekend, I wondered what it would be like if Jeffrey Epstein would have heard and heeded this wealth advisory that we have here in James chapter 5. Now, I understand that any time the Bible talks, starts talking about money or a preacher or teacher of the Bible starts talking about money, we all get a little squirmy. And so what I want to do is just to lay out some general principles here to get started just so you will have that set in your mind. Just a few principles that we find in the Bible, generally speaking, about money, the sensitive topic. Number one, there's no correlation between your material prosperity and your spiritual maturity. There's, there's no correlation between your material prosperity and your, and, and your spiritual maturity. So you can be dirt poor and, and yet at the same time be fabulously, spiritually, eternally rich through the life that we have in Jesus Christ. And at the same time, you can be fabulously wealthy and yet be spiritually bankrupt because you've put all your eggs in that basket. You've focused so much on the material possessions in life, you've ignored that which is eternal, and you've rejected Christ, and so you can be materially wealthy and spiritually dirt poor. So, 
There's really no correlation between your financial condition and your spiritual condition. The second thing I want to say, generally speaking about money, is that wealth, money, isn't evil. There's nothing wrong with having nice things and enjoying nice things. The Bible nowhere condemns that in and of itself. So I want to say that. The third thing I want to say is that while money is not evil, the love of money is. It is not evil to possess money or to possess things. It is evil for your things to possess you. And there's a big difference there. So here in James chapter 5, we have this focus on people whose money possesses them. So this is a blistering rebuke to people who love money so much and who are so thirsty to have more that they are willing to oppress and hurt other people in order to get more. Now realize this is probably what you, you, you may have read this paragraph in the, ta- in the scriptures and thought, what in the world does that have to do with me? I have, I have no idea what this is saying. And so we're all in good company, it, it, it's, it's, but there's a powerful, powerful message here for all of us. So don't tune out just because you don't think you fit into this category. I want you to see three things about our text. First of all, there's an admonition, the admonition. Then there are some accusations, and then there are some applications. So let's first talk about the admonition. It says there in verse 1, now listen, he was getting our attention, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. So out there in the congregation, or perhaps out in the community, there are these people that James calls rich people. And right off the bat, he's up in their faces. They are to repent. They are, the, the words wail and, uh, and, and weep and wail sort of paint a picture of someone who is, who is uh, uncontrollably weeping, if not screaming. And the reason is that they're repenting. James is calling on them to repent of something. And, uh, and so this weeping and wailing is an expression of their repentance. Well, Why? Well, James is making here an economic forecast. The economic forecast is, you see in verse 1, uh, because of the misery that is coming upon you. This misery that is coming. So this word indicates that the misery has already started in their lives, and it's going to continue on all the way into eternity if they don't make a course correction. This is exactly what Paul was talking about when he wrote to Timothy and 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. We've already said that. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. This is what James calls misery. And so we all know that the times when we're doing the best materially and financially may not be the times when we're at the top of our game spiritually. But the fact of the matter is that when we've got some money in our bank account and things are going okay, things are going well, then it's easy for us to forget God. And, uh, and this is where the misery comes from. So people can think that all they need is some more stuff, so they're stuffing their life with, with stuff, and, and, and there's this, uh, uh, this aspiration to acquire more and more and more, and, and unfortunately, they're leaving God out of their lives, and, and now they're experiencing misery now and for the future. Why? Because they're not trusting in the righteousness that comes through Christ and the true riches that come with eternal life. Now, I want to say again that money in and of itself is is not evil as long as it's in the proper place in our lives. Even a good thing can be bad if it's in the wrong place, if it's not in the proper place in your life. For example, a fire in the fireplace is a warm thing. It warms the room. It's a nice, comforting thing to see. So it's, it's good in the proper place. A fire in your dining room is not a good thing. It's a good thing in the wrong place. 
It causes misery. And the same thing is true with money. When it's in its proper place in your life, it brings great joy when it's, no matter how much you have. But when it's in the wrong place in your life, it brings misery. So that's the admonition. That's the warning and the call to repentance. And it's based upon some accusations. That's the next thing, accusations. And there are at least four devastating accusations against those who have money out of place in their lives. And the first one is worthless hoarding. Worthless hoarding. Look at verse 2. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Let me just pause there and say that James is is probably addressing the three most valuable assets in, in ancient times. There is produce, clothing, and then precious metals. So he talks about produce or grain. It can be stored up for a while, and, um, and that's fine. But if you store it for too long, if you hoard it and don't use it, then it rots. It's like, like an apple in your refrigerator that's been there for a year. It's going to rot. So produce or grain. The second valuable asset would have been clothing. It was a measure of wealth in biblical times. The average person really only had one set of clothes. But a wealthy person could have numerous sets of clothes. And James is saying here, you know, what good is it if you have a whole closet full of clothes, but you can't get around to wearing them before the insects eat them up? Again, it's, it's worthless, wasteful hoarding. And then if you think, all right, I'm going to go after something that, that isn't going to uh, deteriorate. So I'm going to go after some silver and gold. But even that, even that in the end is going to be consumed. We think that precious metals will last forever, will hold their value forever. Guess what? You know what heaven paves its streets with? The stuff that we think is valuable here, gold, those streets of gold. They're, that's just the stuff that's so valuable, it's like they pave streets with them in heaven. And so, so he's talking here about, about the, the judgment of God that is coming. And even uh, the things that we think are so precious, they're not going to withstand the fires of God's judgment. All this stuff in the world is going to be consumed. Um, and Nan and I are learning that. Uh, as you probably know, we are in the process of moving and downsizing. And so for the last few months, we've been going through stuff in our house and, uh, and downsizing and preparing to move. And it's been an interesting experience for us. It's been a test for our marriage, I will say, too. But uh, uh, we've, we're, uh, we're working on it and learning some things uh, about life and about stuff and about each other. But, you know, I was thinking that we were, there, there's something at some point in your life that you think is incredibly valuable. We've just got to have this. Our life will be so much better if we have this cappuccino machine or whatever it is. Well, after a while, you, you get tired of that. And it goes in a box, and then it goes in a closet. And so 20 years later, you're going through these boxes, and you find this cappuccino machine that you thought would just save the world for you. And you realize that it's, it's worthless, really. And, and so I, we, we're finding out that we wish that we knew now what we, uh, we knew then, or know then what we know now about the importance of some things. And to realize that the things that we think right now we have to have to make life meaningful for us really isn't that valuable. Now, in, in the last part of verse 3, James paints this grotesque picture. Look at it. You, their corrosion, the corrosion of this gold and silver, will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Now, that's gross. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. And so he's talking here about the judgment of God and the fires of God's wrath that are going to be poured. That's going to melt all that gold and silver and you with it if you're without Christ. It's the, it's the, the, the warning of God's judgment against people who hoard 
wealth that testifies against them in the end. It's what Jesus was talking about. I have to believe that James, the half-brother of Jesus, must have remembered what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 19 and following. He said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So make sure your treasure is something that is truly lasting, eternal things. So James accuses them of worthless hoarding. Number two, he accuses them of sinful exploitation. Sinful exploitation. Look at verse four. Look, the wages you fail to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. And so he's accusing them of cheating the people that work for him in order to have more money. Historians tell us that a common day laborer in biblical times uh, literally lived in poverty. I mean, they were barely able to make ends meet. And, and so if they got paid one day, that literally is like what we call hand to mouth. It was in their hand, it went into their mouth day to day. There was no margin for them. And so if a landowner, a farmer, didn't pay his, his, his worker, that worker and his family would not eat that day. And that's why the Old Testament, uh, the Old Testament laws prohibit a farmer from withholding the wages of a hired hand. They were living that close to the edge. And so what James exposes here are, is the sinful exploitation of workers. And it was like robbery. Now, I know you may have a hard time relating to this and think, does this really happen? Friends, it does. Right here in Fort Worth, Texas, right here in South Fort Worth, it goes on all the time. Our community ministries leaders tell me that the people they serve face this all the time. That they go to work for an employer and they know that because they're poor and disadvantaged, they don't really have many other options, and so they will pay them below what their work is really worth because they know that these, these disadvantaged people have no other options. And so they take advantage of it. It happens right here. And, and so James is spot on as he, as he confronts this. And, and, and the point is that God is concerned. He is concerned about this. He sees it he notices, and what we are insulated to is a harsh reality in many people's lives. God hears their cry, so they're saying, Lord, I, I can barely afford to feed my family on what this guy is paying me. God hears their cries, he takes them seriously, and he holds accountable those who exploit others for their own gain. And, um, and notice he is called there the Lord Almighty. You see that? one of the great names of the Lord, the Lord Almighty. He is mighty to provide for the needs of the poor, but also he is mighty to hold accountable those who oppress the poor. And so that's a part of the wealth advisory. But also there's an accusation against their excessive indulgence. Excessive indulgement, uh, indulgence. Verse 5, you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. So those words luxury and self-indulgent paint the picture of people literally stuffing their lives full of stuff and sensual pleasures and experiences. By the way, ancient historians tell us they found, archaeologists found in the, the uh, ruins of some the homes of wealthy people, they found this vat in many of the homes, and they come to figure out that what it was for is so that rich people could eat and eat and eat and gorge themselves, go throw up, so they could come back and eat and gorge themselves some more. This is what James has in mind here, is that kind of excessive indulgence. And what makes it all the more hideous is the, the, the contrast between 
the extravagance and wasteful indulgence of some people over against the poverty and the need of the poor. So, so it's not wrong for us. Let me say this again. It's not wrong for us to enjoy a delicious meal, to enjoy nice things. God supplies all those things for us to enjoy. What's wrong is when that causes us to ignore the needs of people who are less advantaged around us. And once again, James here paints a grotesque picture. He says that you're fattening yourself for the day of sorrow. It's like you are a, a, a cow being fattened for the slaughter. Again, James is speaking like a prophet here. He's talking about the judgment of God that's going to come on people who, because they have rejected the righteousness of Christ, have, have trusted in their own riches and did so by exploiting others. So we have to live our material lives in light of the day that we will stand before the Lord and give an account of what we've done with what he has entrusted to us. And the last accusation is against their corrupt injustice. Corrupt injustice. Verse 6, you have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. So what James may have in mind here is perverted justice uh, where the rich used the legal system to take advantage of the poor. So they might bribe judges or bribe other officials to gain an advantage over people who do not have access to that kind of advocate. Maybe what James has in mind here. And so he's taking the life from the poor. And the fact is that God sees all of this, and he cares. That's the point. James has the heart of God for those who are disadvantaged. Well, that's a pretty ugly picture. I think we would agree. And so what are we supposed to take away from this? Well, I said earlier that there's truth here for all of us. No matter what your net worth is, there's truth here for all of us. And so let me just give you some quick applications. Number one, instead of worthless hoarding, there should be eternal investments. Eternal investments. That's what Jesus was talking about. Matthew 6, we quoted it earlier. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Well, how do you do that? Well, Paul answers that question. In 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18, these are verses that are so prophetic for us today as American believers. So listen carefully to what he has to say. 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18, command those who are rich in this present world, and I would say having traveled around the world and seen the way most of the rest of the world lives, we as Americans would, would fit into this category, we are rich in this present world, even even if you feel like you are dirt poor today, you are still so much better off than most of the people who live in other parts of the world. So command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. Keep things in perspective. God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment, okay? It comes from the Lord. We can enjoy it. But, he says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. So out of this abundance that we have, and even if you don't feel like <laughs> you're anywhere near well off, the fact is that, that we can be generous and willing to share. I'm going to take just a second here. And just remind you of the Bible's counsel and guidance about how we are to be generous in our giving. The Bible gives us direction on this. This is not my sales pitch about giving. This is what the Bible teaches. First of all, the Bible teaches proportional giving. Proportional giving. You know, we talk a lot about the tithe, and the tithe is simply a tenth. It is a percentage. And so when the Bible 
addresses this matter of giving to, his, to, to God's people, it is always relative to how much God has put in your life. So if you receive much, you give more. If you receive little, you give little. It's proportional. The second thing that we see about generosity in the Bible, and that is it is central. Central. And by that I mean that we do not have autonomy over over our giving. In the Old Testament, this is what's called storehouse giving. In the Old Testament, people brought their tithes and offerings to the storehouse of the temple. It was placed in the hands of the priest who then distributed it for the work and service of the Lord. And then in New Testament times, offerings were brought and placed, notice, at the feet of the apostles, it often says, or later into the hands of the elders who then distributed it according to the needs of the church and the needs in the community. So this is central giving. And then a third, a third category is special giving. Special giving. By that I mean that there are always ministries and causes and, and, and needs that are just really tug at our heart. And so we want to do something to support that. But it is always done over and above what we, have, what we give to our church. So there's proportional giving, central giving, and then after that is special giving. It's the guidance that the Word of God gives to, to us in our generosity. So eternal investments. Second, instead of sinful exploitation, there should be fair dealings. This applies to rich people and to poor. Paul said in Ephesians 4, 28, he who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Again, the goal is not getting, it's giving. And so we must be scrupulously honest in our dealings with others, whether we're the employer or the employee. Number three, Instead of excessive indulgence, there should be godly simplicity. Godly simplicity. The Bible calls this contentment. Uh, Hebrews 13.5 is a great verse to memorize. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And so what you have here is the picture of contentment where where I understand that that bigger TV, that nicer car, that piece of jewelry is not going to add meaning to my life. That my meaning in life, my purpose in life, my sustenance in life is going to come from the, from the Lord. He has promised never to leave. It's his presence that fills our life with meaning, not the stuff of this world. And so we look for ways to simplify Start simplifying your life now. Now, for the other baby boomers in the house this morning, your children will love you for this. Start now simplifying your life and sorting through those things. I, I think of Jesus. He really had hardly anything going through life, but at the very end of his life, you know, he died with just the clothes on his back. He went to the end of life totally spent for the will of God. Everything given for us, most importantly, his life. And what a great way to live, to go to the end of life and know that it's all been spent for the glory of God, given for him. Ask yourself, what steps can I take now? to simplify my life so I can be more generous for the kingdom of God. What steps can I take now to simplify my life so I can be more generous for the kingdom of God? And then there's, there's a final application, and that is instead of corrupt injustice, there should be righteous justice. Righteous justice. James has this on his heart here in the text. 
Remember what Jesus said when he was talking about prayer and the power of prayer in Luke 18, 7, he says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? He will, he will, will he keep putting them off? And the answer is no. So here's the meaning of that. There are people all around us who are, are in great need and are crying out to God and God hears their prayer and he's taking them seriously. And guess what? You may be the answer to someone's prayer for provision. God will hear them and move to meet their need through the grace and the mercy that you show them. You're an answer to somebody's prayer. So God cares. Think about the rich young ruler, that affluent young man in the Bible that came to Jesus one day and wanted to know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gave him that main list of commandments, and this guy said, got it, got it, check, all done. And then Jesus says, well, just wait a minute. There's one thing you lack. And then he devastated the young man by saying, you go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And the Bible says that this guy was devastated, and he went away sad, quote, because he had great wealth. Jesus isn't saying that, that rich people can't get into heaven or have eternal life. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying that you have to give away everything you have in order to get into heaven. In fact, it's just the opposite. He's saying, listen, I have given everything for you. There's nothing that can stand between you and me. If it's your money, it has to be dealt with. If it's your time, it has to be dealt with. If it's your hobby, it has to be dealt with. And we come by faith in Christ for the gift of righteousness. And so, so we can't trust our righteousness to get us into heaven, and we can't trust our riches to sustain us. We have to look to him. Now, where has God put a finger on something in your life today? I want to ask you to bow your head. I, I just believe that the word of God always is used by the spirit of God to bring conviction so is he pointing to something in your life this morning that, that he wants you to deal with? Are your priorities in order? Are you giving as an expression of your discipleship and following Jesus? Are you generous? with your time and your money, and your abilities. Lord, I pray that uh, as we're worshiping now, that you'd continue to speak into our hearts in Jesus' name. Let's stand together.